252 million years ago, our planet faced the largest extinction event in its history. This tragedy claimed the lives of over 80% of all living beings. Creatures both small, fluttering in the skies, and those dwelling beneath the waters suffered. On the supercontinent Pangaea, massive volcanic eruptions began, spreading death across the land. The enormous lava outpour literally scorched oxygen from our air, and strong winds only propelled this process across the globe. The release of vast amounts of greenhouse gases warmed the world ocean. The warm surface water prevented dissolved oxygen from reaching deeper layers, leading to the collapse of food chains. All inhabitants of our planet suffered, and millions of years of their evolution were erased. The world of that time was literally forced to start anew. For a long time, our Earth resembled a wasteland where hardly anything lived. However, not all plants and animals became extinct. As always, the most resilient survived, those able to adapt to any conditions dictated by our planet. And most often, these organisms were undemanding in their needs. Before the Permian extinction, coniferous forests covered the equatorial part of the supercontinent Pangaea. But after the catastrophe, they were virtually wiped from the face of the earth. In their place rose mosses and enormous tree ferns. The thing is, ferns have a very simple method of reproduction, and most importantly, it doesn't require a large amount of nutrients. The spores by which these plants reproduce can be spread by winds over vast territories, allowing them to quickly inhabit huge areas. The main element for the development of ferns is water, and they don't require excessive amounts of it. Just a moist environment for the spores to germinate is enough. This allowed ferns to inhabit territories that previously belonged to coniferous plants. Another plant accustomed to feeding on the remains of other plants was fungi. It's not surprising that for them, this period was relatively easy, as the earth literally abounded in dead organic matter. For several million years after the Permian extinction, fungi were the dominant plants on our planet. The filamentous structures of these parasites quickly infected the sturdy trunks of large trees and consumed them from the inside. Pathogenic fungi are an important part of any forest ecosystem. If the forest is healthy, it easily repels their attacks, but when plants are weakened, they cannot resist attacking fungi. The animal world also suffered greatly from the consequences of the global extinction. And if in the plant world, those survived who fed on the remains of other plants, in the animal world, priority was given to those who could dig deep burrows. This ability allowed living beings to hide from the changing external environment. When the oxygen level on Earth dropped and winds carried volcanic dust around the perimeter, it was life underground that allowed creatures to hide from the devastating consequences. Deep underground, food sources suffered significantly less negative impact than on the surface. It was a wonderful period for creatures whose homes were hidden in the ground. Among them were representatives of cynodonts. This is a Lystrosaurus. It perfectly fit all the parameters necessary for survival at that time. It lived in burrows and dug deep. Powerful hind limbs with claws allowed it to dig deep, comfortable burrows. At the same time, burrows did not hinder Lystrosaurs from traveling long distances. Leaving dangerous areas, they quickly populated new, comfortable places. Being rather slow, they were very enduring, allowing them to cover large distances quickly. Despite their name, they fed not only on leaves. Being herbivores, they found tubers, stems, and coarse vegetation digging up roots, and its tusks 
allowed it to gnaw wood. The structure of the Lystrosaur allowed it to survive the lack of oxygen in the atmosphere. Its large lungs and short nostrils provided rapid breathing. Despite its large size, comparable to that of a pig, Lystrosaurus did not require a large amount of food, and its large size, on the contrary, helped it avoid becoming prey to other surviving creatures. Lystrosaurs were very similar to their relatives from the Cynodont genus, Dicynodonts. They had a similar structure and a similar way of life. For many years after the extinction, this genus constituted half of all terrestrial vertebrates. 248 million years ago, the climate began to stabilize. The single supercontinent Pangaea divided our planet into two parts. One part had land, while the other, larger part, was completely covered by water. In some parts of our planet, forests formed, completely covered with green plants. Coniferous trees gradually began to outcompete ferns and re-establish their forests. Other parts of the land became so arid that deserts formed. The climate in these parts was extreme. Temperatures soared to 60 degrees on scorching days and didn't drop below 25 degrees at night. Constant raging sandstorms formed dunes over a kilometer high. Despite such harsh conditions, life still existed. However, not everyone could survive in such challenging conditions. Cold-blooded animals were best adapted. They had a unique ability to adapt their internal temperature to the external environment. Life thrives on the shores of the Atacama Desert, which formed about 230 million years ago. Lizards are well adapted to it. Their tough outer shell allows them to withstand the blazing sun. Water inside them does not dry out, but circulates normally. Being cold-blooded, they can adapt to the changing environment, and when their blood heats up, it allows them to develop super speed. Additional energy expenditures require them to obtain additional energy, but besides food, they also need water. Water, which is as precious as gold in the desert, because it's always scarce. But here, on the shore, it still exists. The problem is that it's unfit for drinking. Seeping through the ground, this water is very salty. A few sips of such water, and the lizard dies. Therefore, evolution forced them to seek other sources of water. And these sources are insects. After the extinction, there were very few of them. The thing is, when salty water enters the insect's body, desalination occurs. As a result, excellent flying water tanks are obtained, which the lizard can feast on. But the difficulty lies in catching them, because insects, like lizards, also want to live, and they will do everything to fly away from their pursuer. But today, luck is not on their side. The shores of desert water sources have become a real battlefield for their inhabitants. Because not only one lizard wants water, everyone does. And each of them is ready to kill to get it. Battles between lizards occur here quite often, and none of them wants to lose. A large number of sharp teeth allowed lizards to grab onto the skin of their opponent, and a powerful neck allowed them to throw their prey almost half a meter away but some of them were smarter. Understanding that every battle, even a one-one, brings health problems. This lizard prefers to only watch the fight. Understanding that a swarm of sand flies has flown to another place, it instantly changes its interest in the fight and starts catching insects without competition from other lizards. Cold-blooded animals make up a large part of the animals on our planet. These are snakes, alligators, and crocodiles. Fish are also cold-blooded. Traveling along the imaginary boundaries of the seas, they can adapt to the water temperature. So, 
In warmer bodies of water, fish accumulate less fat, while in colder waters, fish are forced to accumulate more fat, which serves as a protective layer, protecting its internal organs from the cold. The inhabitants of the aquatic environment suffered the most after the Permian extinction. Their numbers decreased by almost 90%, and some inhabitants disappeared from our planet forever. But there were those who appeared for the first time. New mollusks, such as oysters, first formed in the seas. They buried themselves in the bottom sand, passed water through their shells, and filtered food particles from it. The largest inhabitants of the oceans at that time, sharks, were also able to overcome the boundary of the Permian period. At that time, they were not as fearsome predators as they are now. But 250 million years ago, they were forced to fight for their existence. Sharks, fleeing from the acidic coastal waters at the end of the Permian period, moved into deeper oceans and lived there for a hundred million years. Thanks to their adaptive abilities, they were able to adapt to life at an unusual depth, and this allowed them to cope with the changes caused by the mass extinction. Later, in the middle of the Triassic period, they returned to their familiar heights, which allowed them to significantly increase in size. During the Triassic period, primitive bony fishes began to appear for the first time. Their powerful fins, developed dental apparatus, and sturdy yet lightweight skeleton allowed them to rapidly spread in the seas of our planet. Ray-finned fishes sharply increased in diversity. Finally, they were able to compete effectively with other classes of fish. Among the ray-finned fishes, predators similar to modern pike emerged, with the largest Triassic ray-finned fishes reaching up to one meter in length. Arthropods continued to decline. Overall, the animal world under the water was in a very challenging situation. Millions of years of evolution were overturned in an instant. Therefore, all efforts were directed towards the recovery of the animal world. The more animals adapted to the changes that occurred on our planet, the more brightly those who would later dominate the world emerged. At a time when Lystrosaurs dominated the land, some reptiles grew up to three meters in length. This Erythrosuchus was the largest predator of its time. They had relatively large heads and short necks. They were incredibly fierce compared to Lystrosaurs. Strolling leisurely through the desert, the Erythrosuchus stumbled upon a herd of Lystrosaurs. For him, they were an easy target. Despite the fact that he would only need a few Lystrosaurs for food, he decided to kill more than he needed. Over time, predators will exterminate all Lystrosaurs, depriving the mammals of that time of their crown. After the Permian extinction, reptiles became the true rulers of the planet. They became the first terrestrial vertebrates well adapted to life on land in conditions of water scarcity. Their dry and tough skin, which lacked glands that secreted mucus, served as an excellent mechanism for water conservation. They inhabited the tropics and subtropics and were able to live in very dry climates, such as steppes, semi-deserts, and deserts. Today, there are more than 10,000 species of reptiles, but they are very different from the reptiles of the Triassic period. At that time, they were much fiercer and more powerful. Harsh conditions forced them to be better prepared for sudden changes in the external environment. Moreover, a large number of competitors on land also made them more aggressive, as the strongest wins in the struggle for life. For reptiles, tough skin played not only a protective role. Thanks to their skin, some individuals became true masters of camouflage. Some, like the current chameleon, are able to change the color of their skin depending on the surrounding environment. Skin also serves a deterrent function. Some reptiles had characteristic spiky growths that prevented them from becoming prey for other animals. 
However, for some reptiles, skin had a completely different purpose, like anoles. This is a genus of iguana-like lizards, which includes more than 437 species of different lizards. However, they all have one thing in common. Inhabiting the northern parts of South America, these lizards have unique abilities. Their skin allows them to breathe underwater. When the lizard is underwater, it inflates a bubble, which immediately adheres to the water-repellent skin. This bubble allows them to breathe underwater for 15 minutes. Such an air bubble acts like a scuba tank and provides the animal with an additional supply of air underwater. One of the main inhabitants of the Triassic period were archosaurs. The first archosaurs were small animals that hunted small game along the shores of lakes and rivers. Later, much larger animals evolved from them. These creatures had a special structure of the thigh which allowed them to stand on their hind legs. This novelty was a serious advantage as it allowed them to move quickly. Later, all crocodiles and birds will evolve from archosaurs. And for now, by learning to walk on two legs, these animals strongly resembled the first dinosaurs. One of the largest groups of Triassic archosaurs were the Crurotasi. They included crocodile-like phytosaurs, herbivorous etosaurs, and several other groups. Modern crocodiles evolved from them. All crocodiles, without exception, are predators, and they have well-developed abilities to sneak up on their prey unnoticed. Unaware of the danger, the antelope leans down to quench its thirst. The crocodile, waiting in the water, attempts to seize its prey. Mist. But it doesn't matter. The Nile crocodile knows that the antelopes will return, as they always do. To avoid being noticed, the crocodile quietly submerges underwater. It can hold its breath for almost an hour. Furthermore, crocodiles can slow their heartbeat to as few as two beats per minute and suspend almost all vital processes. Reptiles perfected this technique millions of years ago. But in an instant, it launches its attack. The transition from inactivity to explosive energy takes only a second. It builds up the necessary speed and strength to propel its five-meter body out of the water. Crocodiles still use this technique today as successfully as their prehistoric ancestors. They dominate their environment. However, these predators are not as numerous as before. Here's another evolved inhabitant of today's lands. It also descended from ancient reptiles, the iguana. This animal inhabits Central and South America. Adult iguanas can grow up to one and a half meters in length, but most of their size is made up of their tail. The color of the iguana depends on its habitat and age. In Peru, for example, they appear bluish, while they are often green in color. This variety of colors indicates that the iguana is capable of excellent camouflage, adapting to external circumstances. They have excellent vision, allowing them to recognize objects and their movements over long distances. But as darkness falls, their vision worsens. A unique element inherited by the iguana from its ancestors is the third eye. It is located on the skull. This rudimentary light-sensitive organ was passed down from its distant ancestors, but unfortunately, it now serves no purpose. Unlike most other species in its family, iguanas are exclusively herbivorous creatures. But not all members of their family were so benign. On some islands in Indonesia, conditions still exist that allow a glimpse into ancient times, because here, Lizards have lost their dominance. Only just born, she begins to explore the world. The first steps of a young female in lizard paradise. It would seem that nothing could be better, but not everything is smooth. Her main problem is her relatives. After all, this is a baby Komodo dragon, 
and Komodo dragons are cannibals. Using their forked tongue to search for food, they can mistake a small baby for a nice snack. Fortunately for her, the adult dragon found an easier prey, a nest with unhatched dragon babies. However, for this monster, it's just a light snack. And so, hiding in the trees, she will spend another eight years before she grows up and can fend for herself. Dragons have sharp teeth, but what's even more important is that their mouths secrete deadly venom. Small buffalo calves are powerless against it. The secreted venom prevents blood clotting, resulting in profuse bleeding and a drop in blood pressure. Death is inevitable. Plesiosaurs only appeared in the Triassic and had not yet spread properly. They were relatively small, up to two meters in length. But other aquatic animals thrived in the water, namely ichthyosaurs. These four-legged creatures, like modern dolphins and whales, have fully transitioned to an aquatic lifestyle. They acquired very important evolutionary changes, namely a hydrodynamically perfect body shape and mastered viviparity. Unlike cetaceans, ichthyosaurs did not use echolocation and relied mainly on vision. Because of this, their eyes were huge, some species reaching up to 20 centimeters in diameter. Externally, ichthyosaurs are very similar to dolphins, the only noticeable difference being the presence of hind legs. By the way, dolphins also evolved from ichthyosaurs, but their hind limbs atrophied due to disuse. The main representative of ichthyosaurs was the Shastasaurus. This creature was one of the largest known marine reptiles. Shastasaurus had a long, flexible body that reached an impressive length of up to 20 meters. Its smooth and hydrodynamic body shape allowed it to move quickly and efficiently in the water. Although Shastasaurus spent all its time in the water, it had four flippers, reminding us of its origin. Inhabiting different parts of the world's oceans, Shastasaurus terrified other aquatic inhabitants. Near the shores of the oceans lived a truly enormous creature, Tanistrophius. This amazing lizard inhabited the territory of present-day Europe and Asia. Tanistrophius was a symbiosis of a small sauropod and a plesiosaur. On the one hand, it had a long neck, led a semi-aquatic lifestyle, and hunted fish. But on the other hand, it was also well adapted to land, having four legs and pneumatization of some bones. One of the most remarkable features of Tanistrophius is its long neck, consisting of 12 vertebrae with very small legs. It might seem that with such a strange body structure, its neck should outweigh the torso, leading to its collapse. But nature provided Tanistrophius with very lightweight vertebrae in its neck, allowing it to move normally on land. This tall reptile spent a considerable amount of time underwater, and thanks to the structure of its body, it could even swim. It's no wonder that Tanistrophius's diet mainly consisted of seafood. With its sharp teeth, it impaled fish and consumed them. Despite the large number of terrifying creatures similar to Nothosaurus in the water, turtles moved back to the sea. Growing competition on land forced them to return to where their ancestors lived. Turtles are very diverse, ranging from small turtles to large ones. Some of them are herbivores, while others prefer to eat fish, amphibians, and invertebrates. But the only thing that unites all turtles is their shell. This shell saves them from predators. This sturdy framework serves as a home for the turtle during rest and as a refuge where they are safe from death. Even those turtles that return to the sea are forced to come ashore once a year. Only on land can they lay eggs and continue their lineage. Near the borders of the Great Barrier Reef, hundreds of turtles gather. 
This ritual has become habitual for them, and for millions of years, this tradition has remained unchanged. Besides tradition, it's a great way to protect themselves. The more turtles there are, the less likely they will become prey for deadly predators. Marine reptiles constantly try to crack the powerful shell of turtles, but when there are many of them, it's difficult for them to choose a target. Turtles try to reach the shore as quickly as possible, where they were once born. Now it's their turn to give birth to their offspring. By laying eggs, they continue their lineage, which has inhabited our planet for 150 million years. After two months, little turtles hatch. Even as babies, they understand that the most comfortable environment for them is the water. That's where they head. But their journey is not as smooth as it may seem at first glance. High in the sky above them, another group of hunters soar, appearing during the Triassic period. About 50 million years ago, before the appearance of turtles, flying animals began to appear in the sky. And if earlier the world was familiar with small dragonflies or insects, now real birds appeared. But these birds were even larger than they are now. These creatures evolved from common ancestors with dinosaurs, but pterosaurs managed to develop wings. They have elongated jaws to capture their prey. Thanks to their sharp beaks, they can not only grasp their prey, but also knock it off its feet. And these rulers of the sky saw a large number of little turtles. For them, this is a target, and the only thing that can save the little turtles is luck and speed. Not all of them will reach the water, only the luckiest ones. With each successful maneuver reaching the depths, it can get rid of pterosaurs and hide beneath the waves. In the Triassic period, pterosaurs were relatively small, but even then, this was absolutely revolutionary. There had never been any danger from the air before, and now animals on land also had to look up to not miss the invasion of flying predators. Fortunately, at first, being weak enough, pterosaurs preferred to feed primarily on sea inhabitants as they were an easier target than land dwellers. Scanning the water space, pterosaurs aimed to find prey, and as soon as they found it, they dived, plunging their beak into the water. But pterosaurs were not averse to feasting on the remains of terrestrial creatures. Millions of years after the largest extinction on our planet, the climate began to change again. But fortunately, not as significantly as before. Dormant volcanoes began to erupt again due to earthquakes. All this led to another warming period and to deaths. However, surprisingly, only a small number of different genera became extinct forever. Undoubtedly, during the Triassic-Jurassic extinction event, many animals perished, but globally, the Earth did not lose unique species. In the northern part of Pangaea, the winds were very humid due to cooler temperatures. These moisture-laden winds collided with mountain ranges 3,000 meters high. Upon hitting them, they continued their journey along a single route, thus creating large monsoon streams. Such streams soon began to cover the entire globe. As a result, rain poured down onto the earth. Incredibly prolonged rain. Rain that lasted two million years. What was once deserts now turned into green forests. Forests that provided a more favorable environment for all living organisms. Winds from the high northern mountains descended. By dispersing the winds and intensifying the rain, the soil quickly began to receive a large amount of nutrients. This was what it had been lacking for growth for so long. For the first time, unified water arteries began to form, flowing across large parts of the globe. These were wide and long rivers. Thanks to them, a greater number of plants could receive the necessary nutrients. The circulatory system of our planet was formed, without which its development would not have been possible. The conditions created by heavy rainfall were not to everyone's liking. 
Many ancient reptiles felt uncomfortable in such an environment and could not adapt to the new conditions of the world. But there were those who adapted so well that they would dominate for 150 million years. Externally, they were very similar. Their offspring were born just like other reptiles, hatching from eggs. They had the same dense and scaly skin, the same dietary preferences, and they also had to take care of themselves from the moment they came into the world. But they had something that allowed them to dominate the world. This was an improved circulatory system. Their hearts were more powerful, allowing them to pump blood at a faster rate. Such innovations allowed them to grow larger and larger. They also developed a more efficient respiratory system, which was only facilitated by improved circulation. As a result, they could run without stopping to catch their breath. This allowed them to cover long distances and hunt for longer periods. The structure of their bodies was balanced. Large and powerful limbs supported the torso and neck. Some of them walked on all fours, while others moved on two legs. And most importantly, all these limbs were positioned strictly under the body, not to the sides like those of ichthyosaurs. Thanks to this, they could walk vertically. Vertical movement allowed them to give birth to larger offspring. These were dinosaurs, who were just beginning to appear then. The largest group of these creatures were prosauropods. They had long necks and long tails, primarily feeding on plants. The largest family of Triassic prosauropods were the Platyosaurus, reaching eight meters in length and weighing almost a ton. The Platyosaurus was the main representative of this family. Thanks to its long torso, it could easily reach high branches. The world gave us new rulers. Thanks to their adaptive abilities, strength and power, they brought forth a vast number of truly unique inhabitants. Unique in their strength, size and habits. Perhaps this is the most interesting period in the history of our planet, a time when everything flourished for 150 million years. Nature and the animal world were in symbiosis of global development. Trees reached their peak heights. Birds in the sky deafened the earth with their shout. And on the ground, there were not the usual volcanoes, but rather colossal 15-meter creatures. This was a time when there were practically no extinctions. This was the Jurassic period a period of flourishing for the mightiest creatures, dinosaurs. Be sure to subscribe to our channel. In the next video, we will tell you how they managed to conquer the entire world. Thanks to what unique properties they were able to reign on our planet and how they fought among themselves.